So when the greatest footballer player of all times, um, I'm talking about Thierry Henry, went <laughs> from Monaco to the greatest team of all times, namely Arsenal FC, I can see who's going to be on the Dean's list at the end of the year, so that's very good. Um, what he said was that when he was in France, in Monaco, the coach was insisting on his weak points and trying to improve on the weak points and, and, and correct them. And then when he went to England, people just picked on his one or two strong points and just focused on that to try to make it the strongest guy in the world on these two things. So true to my culture and nationality, I basically spend my time whining about the weak points of the private equity industry, which is what I study. So the sorts of things I spend my time whining about, I mean, I whine about about everything, uh, except for, for, for wine and, and for, for cycling. But <laughs> in private equity, I spend my time whining about the fees, especially like the hidden ones. I, sp I whine about the performance of the way it's computed that may be misleading to people and these sorts of things. I'm working on all kinds of projects at the, at the moment, all in private equity, that's all I do. Um, and I don't have really time to go through all of them, but we do things like forecasting returns in different segments of private markets, like real estate, private equity, infrastructure, etc., in order to better inform people in their asset allocation decisions. We have papers on competition uh, in, uh, across companies that are held by private equity firms. Uh, we have some very cool uh, uh, results on that in the hotel industry that is quite uh, uh, concentrated in terms of ownership by private equity uh, firms. So we have a number of projects like that, but I'm going to talk to you about the one uh, uh, that I've uh, completed and published recently on, on, on fees, in particular hidden fees. So first to get everybody up to, uh, to speed on what private equity is, um, imagine someone uh, uh, called Louise, and Louise um, has no money, um, and she uh, likes hotels, and she identifies a hotel in Oxford she really likes, um, and would like to buy that hotel, and she has an idea of two, uh, how to make this hotel like a, a very great one. And so what she does is that she goes to the endowments of uh, uh, these colleges in Oxford, and this endowment says, yeah, we, 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 we think you're smart, you're going to convert our uh, few pounds into zillions of euros, so you know, we will send you money whenever you find something, um, just give us a call, and we'll do that. And then Louise finds this hotel that, is, that costs, let's say, one million pounds. And what she does is that she uses a lot of debt, actually, to buy that hotel. So she goes to the bank and would, in private equity, typically borrow like 70% of the money. So she would borrow 700,000 to buy this hotel and then ring the college endowments in Oxford for the remaining 300. And then she would buy this hotel. And then she's like on very high speed journey from then on because her goal is to make as much money as possible in the shortest amount of time possible. So the rule of the game in private equity is very clear. It's capitalism on steroids. It's, it, 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 it's a pure thing. You just want to make as much money as possible uh, uh, in the shortest uh, time possible. Now people call that, we like growing companies, but you know, if it takes, usually you, know, you make money if you grow your company. But if, it, if you need to cut the things into pieces to make more money, people would do that. Okay? So the goal is clear, it's just to make uh, as much money as possible. And sometimes this, this leads to very good things. So when Louise has this pressure to make as much money as possible, she will work very hard to make this hotel amazing and that people will enjoy staying at the hotel and, and, and so on, make it as efficiently run as possible, because that's the way to make this hotel worth a lot more and for her to make a lot of money. In some other situations that may lead to some tensions, like for example, when we see, especially in the US, some uh, emergency care services or some uh, elderly homes run for, for profits by private equity firms, there, there, there might be some more tensions with um, the conflicting goals. So in the example of a hotel, Sir Louise is going to get this hotel, try to make it worth as much as possible in order to sell it in like three, four years time for the highest price possible. Now, for that, she's going to charge some fees, and she has like a management fee that she would charge, which is like, you know, if, if the colleges are giving her 300 million, she would charge 2% of that a year. And then when she sells the hotel, if she makes a profit, she will keep a share of that, like 20%. 
So what happens in practice is that Louise is actually not really going to call the management fees from the colleges. She's going to call just a little bit. And what she's going to do instead is that she's going to take the money directly from the hotel revenues to pay herself for stuff. So Louisa may say, oh, I think like this wall needs to be uh, repainted. And so um, we're going to do that. And that was actually a lot of work, this interior design I've just done here. So that's going to be like 100,000 um, pounds. And she takes 100,000 pounds from, the, call, from the, the hotel to pay herself for these services. So Louise is going to do a lot of things like that. And you can see immediately the conflicts of interest, whereby Louise is in charge of this hotel on behalf of the college endowments and then partially of the banks. And she calls the shots. She controls this hotel. She's the one running it with someone else's money. So she is quite conflicted, and she may be very tempted to take money directly from the revenues of the hotel to pay herself for stuff. Okay? And whether this is like legit, whether this is like the right price, whether it is too much, etc., is, is, is an open question. It's a bit hard to pin down, and it's very hard to pin down also how much she took. And so the deal is basically that she's hardly going to call any fees from the colleges. And she's going to take things from the revenues of the hotel, and she's going to keep this 20% of the profits. Which means that the colleges, in turn, are quite happy because what they do is that they turn to their donors, alumni of the colleges, and say, look, we are investing in all this fancy stuff, like these hotels, private equity, etc., and we hardly pay any fees for this because we hardly send any check to Louise for her services. So it's really awesome, right? And so that's one aspect of, of the issue, the underreporting of fees by, by endowments because of these arrangements uh, by Louise. But we need to know how much Louise is taking out of the revenues of the hotel to pay herself for things. So this is a project that lasted for like three, four years. We went through about 30,000 pages of SEC filings. Things always have, like you have companies and you know the hotel is not under the hotel names. There's a shell company that is domiciled in the Cayman Islands that like reports some of the things of this hotel, etc. Things are buried in all kinds of footnotes. But when you have related party transaction and for certain type of companies, you have to report it somewhere, somehow to the SEC. So we went through all these documents, found out the numbers, and we published a paper saying how much uh, uh, fees were taken directly from the asset and therefore came on top of the, what people thought was the cost of private equity, et cetera. And that contributed as well to the bill that is not revealed by the, the college endowments in terms of like how much fees they give to private equity type people like Luis. So I took this example because uh, it links to something I'm, I'm just back from. Uh, I'm just back from San, uh, Harrisburg in Pennsylvania, out of all places. And the reason I was in Harrisburg in Pennsylvania on Thursday was because I was testifying in front of a the Senate there about uh, their pension funds who had massively underreported the fees they paid to private equity for the reasons I just gave. So the pension fund said, well, we recently have increased the number of fees we are reporting. And over the last 10 years, we, we, we paid a total of 2 billion. But the real number, according to simulations and projections based on, 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 on my research and the few documents I had access to about them, was that they probably paid north of $6 billion uh, in fees. And these pension funds in Pennsylvania are underfunded by about 50%. So they, they are basically down 80 billion. Um, and if they don't find 80 billion, which is a sizable amount of money when your total assets are 20, 80 billion, um, then this is the, the treasury, so Pennsylvania's taxpayer that would foot the bill. So, um, so that's an example of how these years of research on finding out how much fees have been hidden or, 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 or taken in different ways, etc., or finalizing the uh, uh, limited partnership agreements uh, that are uh, signed by, by uh, these pension funds and college endowments with the private equity fund managers, how that leads to something very concrete, which is the Treasury at one point wants to know, OK, they earn 10% in private equity over the last 10 years. It is OK. Uh, and how much did we pay for this? They tell us two billion, but the real number is, is, is way above six. Okay. So that's an example of, of, of the sorts of work and, and whining I do, and why I have a massive amount of friends in the industry. Uh, <laughs> and that's what, it's part of what I will teach in, in Hillary in the course called Private Equity, and I look forward to see a subsample of you there. 
Thank you very much.